Canada, one of the world's largest countries. It was a singular challenge for explorers and pioneers to open this vast land. The railways played a central role. And today you can cross Canada on historic train routes that follow great rivers, blaze through forests and tundra, and climb through rocky mountains from sea to sea to sea. Our journey continues through Western Canada as we leave the prairies behind, cross the foothills of Alberta, and explore the highest reaches of Canada from the Yukon to Vancouver Island. We'll ride over the Rockies on the famous transcontinental train, the Canadian, and on the Rocky Mountaineer rail tours, reach the interior of British Columbia on the Skeena, follow the Caribou Wagon Road, and climb aboard the Malahat Dayliner on the Pacific Coast. Our journey begins as we reach Edmonton, known in Canada as the Gateway to the North. The capital of Alberta is a vibrant city on the North Saskatchewan River. In the center of the city, close by the provincial legislature, is the original site of Fort Edmonton. These archaeology students have been digging up the past, literally. There was a West Warehouse put in after 1860, and that's what we're, we're in investigating. In the 12 weeks that we've been digging, we've come up with over 14,000 artifacts from the site, ranging from pieces of, of bone to little tiny trade beads and ceramics. It's really wonderful, and it's great to be, to be doing part of Edmonton's history. It opened in May of 1974 as a result of Edmontonians who wanted to preserve their history. And so Fort Edmonton Park is actually a representation of four periods of time from 1846 when we had a Hudson's Bay fur trading post and then our streets of 1885, 1905 and 1920. And we try to recreate life as it would have been. It took a whole year to get this Baldwin steam locomotive looking as it did a century ago. The two coach cars could carry as many as 110 passengers. Edmonton's original city railway was vital for the settlement's business. Until the railway went in, everything traded through Edmonton had to be hauled by wagon or sled and shipped by riverboat across the North Saskatchewan River. The streetcar that you just saw go by has actually been in operation since 1908, so it's a real treasure to us. And cars and trucks have been donated to us, Model A's, uh, we have the Edmonton's first uh, tour bus is, is here with us in the park. So there's a multitude of things that have been restored, generally through volunteer support. Between the 1890s and 1930s, almost a quarter of a million Ukrainians settled in this east central part of Alberta, and this is the history that we show. We've moved over 30 buildings, including homes, businesses, churches, um, a school, from towns and farms in this part of Alberta. We've moved them here, restored them to what they looked like in that time period, and we have uh, role players, people in costume, that portray the actual pioneers. I, I think it's a fascinating history. Um, my great-grandparents came to Canada and I heard the stories when I was younger about living in a clay and log house with a clay oven inside. And I, I find that senior citizens appreciate it as well because they can say, oh, you know, I remember that. And they explain to their grandchildren how it might have worked. Elk Island started out in 1906 as Canada's first wildlife refuge for large mammals, specifically the elk. And uh, we have a, a large plains bison herd as well. Right now, we're in the middle of their mating season. The bulls engage in, in, in displays one to another 
to establish dominance. Eventually, a pecking order is established, and, and, and of course, the dominant animal um, has the breeding privileges, but he's not above being challenged. And, and if he's gathering a harem, it takes a lot of his time and energy to, to keep this harem together. Um, and he's kept from feeding and all that sort of thing. So he becomes very irritable. But for 80 years, Elk Island was, uh, was a place where fire didn't occur. Or if it did occur, it was an all-out battle to stop it, whether it was from a lightning strike or from uh, a careless camper. Um, we, f we put out every fire. And in this environment that at one time was, was uh, woodland and, and open prairie meadow, uh, we now have a closed forest. To restore the park's natural diversity, fire was reintroduced into the ecosystem. It pushed back the aspen forest and allowed the native species to regain a foothold. This eerie sandstone landscape was once a subtropical swamp. More than 70 million years ago, it was actually a corner of the Gulf of Mexico. Today in Dinosaur Provincial Park, it's a little difficult to visualize Edmontosaurus and other prehistoric giants munching away on leafy greens. This is a 70 million year old dinosaur playground around here. They had about five million years left before the final extinction. By now, they're getting small, getting fast, they're getting smarter. They're starting to be about the size of a big greyhound. Dinosaur Provincial Park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It stretches some 27 kilometers along the banks of the Red Deer River. These badlands and prairie hold one of the richest deposits of dinosaur fossils anywhere. Long after the dinosaurs had disappeared, buffaloes met their end at a place called Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump. This World Heritage Site near Fort McLeod had been used for 6,000 years to harvest bison. Native bands would drive thundering herds over these steep cliffs. In the mid-1800s, firearms came on the scene, leading to the indiscriminate slaughter of buffalo by both native bands and white hunters. Within three decades, the great herds had disappeared from the plains, and the simple economy of the native people had collapsed. This buffalo jump was in use about the same time or before the pyramids were getting built over on the other side of the world. Before the horse was even introduced to the Blackfeet Nation tribe, what they call imitatas, dog team days. Every year, at about this time of the fall, is when they use this buffalo jump. If you take all the roads and the buildings and the fences all off out of here, and you put 60 million buffalo out there roaming at one time, buffalo. Hey, that one guy, old guy was talking about, if you were gonna go across country here, and that buffalo just happened to be going by, you'd have to sit and wait three days and three nights just for a herd just to pass by. Here at this buffalo jump is where the people get their, that's their survival. This is where the, uh, the stories come out, is the survival and how he lived for the winter months. He got enough food, just like the white man, he'll butcher beef and put in his deep freeze. This is the same thing. To the elders here is a sacred ground today. From Edmonton, the Canadian heads west to the Rocky Mountains. In the beginning, the railway was supposed to link the provinces and bind them into Confederation. It turned out to be just as good for tourism. CPR's general manager, William Van Horn, took one look at the Canadian Rockies and said, if we can't export the scenery, we'll import the tourists. And he did. People come from all over the world to marvel at the spectacle of ice and snow, glaciers and rocky peaks. There are three main passes into the mountains, at Jasper in the north, at Crow's Nest in the south, and here, just west of Calgary, at Banff National Park. Banff was Canada's first national park. It's still the most popular. It stretches for hundreds of kilometers along the continental divide. The mountains first emerged from under a vast inland sea some 70 million years ago. Over the millennia, their fantastic shapes were roughly carved by ice sheets nearly a kilometer thick. 
then smoothed and sculpted by the erosive forces of wind and water. What's left of those ice sheets can still be seen in the glaciers and ice caps that cling to the high peaks and poke their icy tongues into the valleys and the rivers. In a setting fit for a priceless gem, Lake Louise is backdropped by the Victoria Glacier, while a giant glacial moraine dams its milky green waters. Banff Springs, Canada's castle in the Rockies. The CPR set out to design a series of luxury hotels along the railway line through the Rocky and Selkirk Mountains. To reach the hotels, visitors naturally would have to take the train. In 1886, the plans for Banff Springs called for a hotel to be built above the junction of the Bow and Spray Rivers. More than a century later, the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel still stands majestically overlooking the beautiful Bow Valley. Banff is a magnet for winter sports, alpine and cross-country skiing and snowshoeing. Deep champagne powder beckons people from all over the world to challenge these majestic mountains. Elk and moose, cougars and bears, bighorn sheep and mule deer all call these slopes of spruce and alpine fir home. The elk especially wander into town and occasionally take in a game of golf. The giant national parks at Banff and Jasper meet at the Columbia Icefield, which is really 30 distinct glaciers, all that's left of a vast ice shield that covered most of Canada. It's the largest accumulation of ice in the Rockies and is hundreds of meters thick. Down below from the Icefields Parkway, the Emerald Lakes can be canoed and the Athabasca Glacier can be crossed in a snow coach. Columbia Icefield itself is a, just over 100 square miles and it is the mother of all rivers because it does flow into or creates water for three different rivers, the Saskatchewan, the Columbia, and the Athabasca. And each of those rivers flow into three different oceans, so it is a hydrological center of North America, uh, with the Saskatchewan flowing eventually into uh, Hudson's Bay, the Athabasca into the Arctic, and the Columbia into the Pacific. A century ago, Jasper National Park was created. It's one of four connected reserves known as the Four Mountain Park Block, Jasper, Banff, Yoho, and Kootenay. They straddle the Continental Divide and are the largest mountain parkland in the world. Uh, Jasper National Park is a protected area that protects the Rocky Mountain ecosystem, and Jasper National Park is one of the mountain parks in that ecosystem, and we protect uh, wildlife species, vegetation that uh, are representative of this ecoregion. Ever since Canada's transcontinental railway was built across thousands of kilometers of rugged terrain, the route through the Rockies has proved to be the most spectacular for travelers. So that passengers could see the best of the Rockies in daylight, a new rail service was set up in 1990. Rocky Mountaineer Rail Tours breaks the journey into two spectacular days. The trains run eastbound from Vancouver and westbound from either Calgary or Jasper. The venture has been so successful, there are now winter excursions through the snowbound Rockies. The Canadian Rockies are a sparkling jeweled crown. Year-round, world travelers come to look in awe at the mountain routes that wind through a jumble of castle-like ridges, plateaus and matterhorns, tumbling rivers and jagged peaks. 
When anyone sings about springtime in the Rockies, this is what they mean. This always has been postcard country, a backdrop for movies like Rosemary and modern adventures like Heliski. highways, the railways, the mountains, they all merge at Kamloops. It's a natural crossroads and meeting place, and the oldest city in British Columbia. From high above, dining with the stars, you can marvel at Kamloops' perfect position. A new day and the train sets out for Vancouver. The route carries it down the Thompson River to the Fraser, through the Fraser Canyon, jogging from one side to the other and over the bridges at Hell's Gate. Bald eagles patrol, and you might catch a glimpse of an osprey nest. Ahead, Vancouver, Canada's Pacific Gateway. In the 19th century, the railway had brought thousands of Chinese workers to Canada. They came to build the rail lines and to work in the Caribou gold fields. By the end of the century, many had settled in Vancouver's Chinatown. The bustling sidewalks make you feel as if you've been transported miraculously to the Far East. This is Gassy Jack Dayton, an English sailor, who in 1867 came ashore from a seafaring life and opened a saloon. Gassy's bar was popular with the thirsty crews from the Hastings timber mill. Soon, a town sprang up, known as Gastown. Vancouver was on its way. After years of neglect, Gastown's Victorian architecture has been restored, hopefully the way Gassy would have wanted it, including the world's first steam clock. High-end shopping is part of the lure of Vancouver's Robson Street. I think the thing that's unique about Vancouver is uh, the setting uh, that we see, the mountains and the parks, lots of attractions that uh, are good for all ages, like the Capilano Suspension Bridge, uh, Grouse Mountain, Seymour Mountain, some of the uh, canyon areas. Because we have such a mild climate, um, it offers a lot of these things on a year-round basis. 
I always tell people the, the nice thing about Stanley Park is that you can put on your hiking boots in the morning and go hiking alone in, in the forest and watch a very civilized cricket game for lunch and take your family on a cycle around the seawall in the afternoon and have an elegant dinner at one of the restaurants in the evening. The zoo has an interesting history. It dates back to the 1890s. But uh, over the years, they have been phasing out the exotic, more exotic animal section of the zoo. And they're, they're focusing more on uh, rehabilitation and conservation of local endangered species. Along with Stanley Park, uh, Capilano Suspension Bridge was the first paid attraction uh, in Vancouver, and it's been in existence since 1889. It wasn't it, it quite the same uh, then. It was uh, built out of rope and cedar planks, and as you can see now, uh, it's much more uh, stable than you can imagine that first bridge was. But what they did uh, is they, they built the bridge on this side, they lowered it into the canyon, then they had a team of horses on the other side who hauled it up and made it suspend across the canyon. People find it, uh, well, I always say it's a thrill. It's something that they'll never forget. And that uh, I think a lot of people feel quite proud of themselves when they make it across. That They think they, they really conquered something. The University of British Columbia's renowned Museum of Anthropology is a chance for young Native people to discover their roots. Throughout the Northwest Coast, people thought of the beginning of time as an age when different uh, forms of life were interchangeable and animals could become humans by taking off their skins. And we see signs of these transformations in many of the totem poles and art, other art forms. And on the Haida pole to the right, you can see the transformation of a cormorant's wing into an arm and a leg, which are clearly human. And there you can see the ewes, which are the cormorant feathers. And you can also see the way the bird's beak is carved to, to conform to the original shape of the log. Part of my background is Simshian, which I carve in, and I carve in sailor style, which is uh, Squamish. Uh, starting from the top here, um, this whole part here is a headdress, um, which is the Eagle Clan. And these points here, in the old days, like I've used cedar sticks here, but in the old days they used walrus whiskers, uh, which represented potlatches that a chief had had in his life. And coming a little bit lower here, here's the face here. And the eyes are always in this position because uh, uh, Indians in the old days had a very spiritual um, respect for nature and that. So uh, the eyes are never open, like a, a native would never look you in the eye. We have a blanket which is wrapped around him and which has uh, an eagle crest on it, which is carved out in red and black. Uh, in Simshian, in the Salish way, red represents life and black represents the spirit world because we believe that we came from the spirit world from the spirit world here to earth we're the major gateway for all of the uh, trains and motor coaches going to the canadian rockies and then on a more local basis we can get uh, very quickly to vancouver island victoria or up to the Sunshine Coast, uh, or into the northern part of British Columbia through any of the rail routes or highway routes. So we're, we're really the, the hub for everything that happens in British Columbia. Not all train routes survive. The Whistler Northwind was a luxury rail service that ran from Vancouver to Prince George in the interior of British Columbia. The North Wind was designed as a throwback to the grand and elegant old days of train travel. The excursion started in Vancouver, heading north along the edge of Howe Sound. The Whistler North Wind's route followed the old Caribou Wagon Road, built when gold was discovered along the Fraser River. In its day, this feat of engineering was called the Eighth Wonder of the World. This railway was actually an outgrowth from the eventual collapse of the gold rush era, but it was a long time coming. They built 10 miles of track in 1910, but they couldn't make a go of it. And in 1912, the government of the day took over, and in February of 1912, uh, the new railway was amalgamated 
and that was called the Pacific Great Eastern. PGE, Pacific Great Eastern. Soon it came to stand for other names like PGE, Prince George Eventually, or Please Go Easy. Every foot of the way was a challenge. The route climbs from a mere 800 feet to uh, 3,400, always with the train hanging inside the, the edge of the lip of the canyon. It's absolutely spectacular. At the end of the first day's outing, the train would pass over 60 meter high Brandywine Falls and then pull into one of the world's best ski destinations, the resort at Whistler. Both mountains, Whistler Mountain and Blackcomb Mountain, run their lifts and gondolas uh, through the whole summer so people can actually have a mountain experience in a very comfortable way. The city, the, the meadows, the alpine meadows, you may see some wildlife in it. You may be lucky and see a bear. For me, the key really is not only uh, that we have got great skiing, great accommodation, but that we very early recognized how important the greenness of the valley is, how important the, the natural setting of Whistler is, and we managed to preserve that, that natural setting. Uh, winter skiing, of course, is a great thing. Uh, Cross-country skiing, snowmobiling, um, ice sailing, you name it. Again, all these activities are in Whistler. In the morning, a hearty breakfast was served before setting out again by train. Destination on day two, 100 Mile House. For some passengers, a trip like this would not only be an introduction to Canada, but also an introduction to train travel. This is our first. I've never experienced anything like it. Never. We've had a whole generation of young people who have not experienced the, the delights of train travel, and they are overwhelmed when they come on board and find that they can take their eyes off the road and not be stuck in a jam and uh, look at the world going by. And believe you me, you can see there is uh, plenty of work to see out here. I consider my generation was the last where it was a regular everyday part of life. Most train routes don't pass through scenery like this or provide a kind of nature class. In spawning season, coho salmon head home up the Birkenhead River. Ladies and gentlemen, we can see the red bodies of the sockeye salmon as they are making their way up to their spawning grounds. Those of them who are actually lucky enough to make their way up to their birth spots, past the fishermen, past the bears, and up the rapids, they will, the female will clear a section in the gravel, lay her eggs, the male will fertilize them, and shortly after spawning, the life cycle of the salmon is actually over. Ten thousand years ago, Anderson Lake and Seton Lake were just one body of water. Then a giant landslide forever divided the lakes. The land barrier was settled by First Nations people. The water in the two lakes is a different color thanks to the glacial water entering Seton Lake. This water has come from the Bridge River Hydro Project. The Caribou Wagon Road was named for John Angus Caribou Cameron, who struck it rich at Williams Creek, but died alone and penniless in 1888. Many American guests on board who were so enthralled, they said, and they volunteered this, that as far as they were concerned, this far outdid the views they managed to, to get at the Grand Canyons. This is British Columbia's cowboy country. Ranches long dominated life here in the Caribou Plateau. Soon the route climbs again, 
The scars on these granite walls are testament to the backbreaking labor that built this line through the mountains. After the rugged, broken terrain we've just been through, McGillivray Falls appears as a tiny, cultivated mountain oasis. Ginseng is one of British Columbia's most profitable crops. It was discovered in the early 1700s by Jesuit priests, who then began trading it with China. One of the most famous stopovers on the Gold Rush Trail is 100 Mile House, nestled between mountains on British Columbia's interior plateau. New York steak or salmon is wild. Wild BC Coast salmon. Brought in fresh this morning and our chicken is free range. Next day, back on board the train for Prince George, they're serving food again. The chef is a very popular fellow. In the pioneering days before the railroad, travel was an enormous challenge. There are a number of places where the old roadways uh, can be seen. You have to know where they are and what to look for, but yes. The topography of British Columbia is sufficiently severe that uh, passageways for travel are often curtailed to the same uh, very narrow strip of ground. Deep Creek Trestle, 100 meters high and 360 meters long, it's one of the highest bridges in North America. Building it held up the railroad for several years. I firmly believe there is a renaissance of uh, train travel on the horizon. Well, we've had a generation going faster. It hasn't necessarily made things better. The world is now reaching uh, an environmental crossroads, and it would appear that the train uh, travel is going to be one of the answers to reducing these great uh, overruns of automobiles and atmospheric pollution and so on. The Whistler Northwind made the run to Prince George in three days, a memorable trip through magnificent landscapes. There are plans to bring back passenger service, hopefully soon. Prince George was founded at the junction of the Nechaco and Fraser Rivers in the heart of British Columbia in 1806. After the gold rush, prospectors settled in the town because of the forest industry and because it had become the end of the line for the Grand Trunk Pacific Railroad. A museum celebrates century-old treasures. It's one of our gems. It's made of wood and it was constructed in 1903 and is one of the only original snowplows, Russell snowplows, left in North America. And it was built in a boatyard. You'll notice it has round windows like a ship. And the bow construction of the ship was inverted to build the snowplow. We currently have over 52 pieces of rolling stock and 24 heritage buildings on the site. This train, called the Skeena, starts its journey at Jasper in the Rockies. Passengers overnight in Prince George and then continue on to Prince Rupert. Following the route of the Skeena River, the train runs more than a thousand kilometers westbound through the wilderness of British Columbia. It travels a remarkable route across BC's interior plateau, passing more sawmills than settlements. This is a world ruled by the forest industry. Evidence of early bridge building and native traditions have all left their imprint on the landscape. The Skeena follows ancient trails blazed by aboriginals through narrow canyons, broad valleys, and past sculpted mountains on its journey to the Pacific.
The president of the Grand Trunk Pacific Railroad, Charles Hayes, had an idea for Prince Rupert as a planned community at the end of the rail line. He and his vision went down with the Titanic in 1912. Two years later, the rail line finally reached the coast. Prince Rupert was merely a new name for a site that had seen settlements for some 10,000 years, much of it on display at the Museum of Northern British Columbia. Argillite is a stone found on the Queen Charlotte Islands on Haida Gwaii, uh, carved by the Haida Nation. And it's a spectacular material that is found nowhere else in the world. Well, there's some very vivid imagery in terms of animal figures that are portrayed in the Northwest Coast art. And that stems from a very complicated uh, hierarchical system that uh, uses animals as crest figures. Folks not happy with their line of work should check out how others fared in the late 19th century at the North Pacific Cannery. We're trying to take uh, the filling machines and the canning machines of a certain era of time and get them in uh, uh, somewhat of a working order that we can demonstrate the process of the canning of the fish, taking the fish, actually putting it in the can and sealing it. You guys are great! <laughs> wow! Oh, boy, I, I'm thinking you guys were right up with this machine here. This machine would go at 30 cans a minute. Working here was tough. Living may have been worse. This is what the First Nations people lived in. These little shacks. This is wonderful because it's brand new. Right. But this is what they had to live in. Look at those beautiful houses on the boardwalk. That was yes. all managers. Um, the Japanese houses were basically the same thing, but at the other end. You lived in your own town. This is the First Nations town. This is the white town. This is the Chinese town. From Prince Rupert, a half hour by air over the coastal mountains, and you're in the grizzly bear sanctuary at Kutsumatin Valley, where salmon is on all the menus. July, uh, you'll get all the salmon runs that come up, and off the creek when we're at Mills Creek, uh, you'll see like literally like thousands of salmon all jumping out in front and you'll see the seals attacking the salmon and the eagles catching them. So there's a lot that feeds off the salmon. They're pretty important. Prince Rupert is your entree to the Yukon Territory. The territory's capital, Whitehorse, was built on a bend in the Yukon River, near the wild rapids that were once the most hazardous stretch of the Gold Rush Trail. Miles Canyon still has the power of nature on its side and is an awesome spectacle for anyone following the trail that leads to Haines Junction. This is the headquarters of Canada's second largest national park, Cloani. Kluani, along with adjacent uh, Wrangell St. Elias National Park in Alaska, were jointly nominated to the United Nations uh, list of World Heritage Sites in 1979 and were proclaimed uh, the first international World Heritage Site. And that's because of uh, three features, three very prominent features, which are uh, best found in this area of North America. And one is the highest mountains in Canada, of which Mount Logan is the highest, just under 20,000 feet, and it and about 35 other peaks rise above 15,000 feet. Uh, so that's one feature. And these high mountains are very close to the Gulf of Alaska and the Pacific Ocean. So they're battered by Pacific lows that come off of the Pacific year round and uh, dump enormous amounts of snow in the interior ice fields of the park. And that creates the largest nonpolar ice field in the world and that's the second most important feature of the park. This ice field is, is huge. It's uh, in an area of a mile deep, and uh, it comprises two-thirds of the park's 8,500 square miles, so it's a lot of ice. 
As a matter of fact, some glaciologists say that there's as much uh, fresh water locked in the form of glacial ice in Kluwani as all the lakes and rivers on the North American continent. So that's quite, uh, quite a lot of fresh water. We've just landed on the Seward Glacier. It's one of the larger ice fields in, in the complex. On each side of us are some of the higher mountains of the range. We've got uh, Mount St. Elias, which is the second highest, just over 18,000 feet. And alongside of that is uh, Mount Augusta, Mount Cook, Mount Vancouver, and then dominating us at the present is uh, Mount Logan, which is the most climbed mountain in this particular range. But in fact, it doesn't get many ascents over, uh, over the course of the years. Uh, the attraction of it, of course, is being the highest mountain in Canada, but it's also extremely challenging for a mountaineer from a technical standpoint. We are flying across the center of the range, and uh, we're going to leave the range by following the Kaskawalf Glacier down to the Slims River Valley. The Kaskawalf Glacier is one of the larger glaciers it's uh, up to 50 kilometers long, and uh, although it doesn't seem to be, it's, uh, it's five kilometers wide. And uh, it has these very striking moraine patterns, which uh, have made it a very popular mountain for photographers. We're uh, just north of the 60th parallel, which is the border between the provinces and the territories. And um, if we are at the same latitude, further east in Canada would be well above tree line into very subarctic or arctic conditions. But here, because of the Pacific climate, which is uh, salt water only being 100 miles away, we have the northernmost range of a lot of Pacific plant species and southern animal species. Most notable species is doll sheep. And there's about uh, 5,000 doll sheep in the park. The Slims River Valley is notorious for bears and we have about uh, one grizzly bear for every 10 square miles of habitat. We as a people have been, uh, were known as nomadic people. And uh, they weren't nomadic by choice. They had to follow wherever the game was, wherever the, the food, their berries, uh, um, the fish were, and down at Klukshu is one of the main rivers where the salmon come back up uh, through the Alsac. Oh, yeah. A lot of our elders, they, they don't have any kind of thing written down, but they have everything up in their, up in their mind. And uh, the map of this country is up here. The knowledge of, of uh, all our stories and um, all our history going back generation, 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 is all up in here. Prince Rupert is linked by air and ferry to the Queen Charlotte Islands, known as Haida Gwaii, the historic home of the Haida Indians. This is the only part of Canada that escaped the last ice age. The landscape is a remarkable wilderness, including thousand-year-old tracts of rainforest, which the Haida have fought to protect from further logging. The Haida, who have lived on these islands for the last 10,000 years, were almost wiped out in the 19th century by Europeans and by diseases. Traditional villages like Skidans were abandoned a century ago. A memorial pole was designed to contain the remains of, say, a chief or his wife or the like. And the reason there are so many of those left now is that they were the last things that were carved before the villages were deserted. The older poles that were carved before that have since fell and rotted into the ground. But these are, are in the process of decay. As the land continues to swallow up Skidans, Soon, only archaeologists will be able to find evidence of this once complex and thriving community. For a side view of British Columbia, the Queen of the North Ferry steams down the Inside Passage, a natural marine highway that threads south from the Alaska Panhandle to Puget Sound. On one side, the Coast Mountain Range. On the other, thousands of islands. We have um, uh, 
uh, bulk carriers going to Prince Rupert for grain and coal, uh, tugs going from Alaska to um, the U.S. Uh, to Seattle and Bellingham, container barges on uh, being towed, coastal freighters, uh, just about just about anything. Along the shore, there are traces of earlier settlements. We uh, pass Buttedale, which. Uh, was a cannery village. It employed about 350 to 400 people. Uh, farther down the coast, we'll go past uh, Namu, which uh, ceased operations as a, as a cannery village in the early 70s. We're in a rainforest here, so there's, a, there's an awful lot of rain. And these mountains, I mean, they're, they were scoured by glaciers, basically. They go straight up out of the water. The channels are just about as deep as the mountains are high. Um, as a result of, of that glacial action, there's not a heck of a lot of dirt that these trees are holding onto. So when it does rain, the water tends to run off very quickly and the falls are spectacular. Fifteen hours later, we reach Port Hardy on the northern tip of Vancouver Island. Port Hardy was named for Sir Thomas Hardy of the Royal Navy. As captain of HMS Victory, it was Hardy who held the dying Lord Nelson in his arms at the Battle of Trafalgar. Today, Port Hardy's large and well-sheltered harbor thrives on the island's natural resources of mining, logging, and fishing. Just a half hour south of Port Hardy is Telegraph Cove. Johnson Straits narrows down. It's like a big funnel. So it funnels all this food source into a very, very narrow hunting area. Makes it very easy for the whales to hunt. Johnson Strait and Blackfish Archipelago are summer homes for killer whales. Naturalists take you out to the protected waters and explain the many whale identification and research programs. The whole region is an ecological dream. Its base is in one of the last boardwalk villages in British Columbia. At one time, the old timbers of the Wiccaninish Inn clung to these rocky shores through wild storms. Now it's being refurbished, but nature at its wildest is still close to this historic retreat. The nearby coastal community of Tofino is a prime spot for whale watching. Each spring, some 22,000 of these giant gray whales cruise these waters. This is a traditional migration route for these pods known as the Eastern North Pacific, or California whale. Pacific Rim is uh, right on the edge, so where the land meets the sea. So wherever you find an edge, you're going to have a profusion of life, right from the ocean itself, which is well known in the Pacific for having oodles of different kinds of neat little critters in the tide pools, to the big whales that migrate past here in the spring and then once again in the fall. But also you've got the land animals, and there's all kinds of neat things in the forest here. Winter here on what is sometimes called the edge of nature can bring spectacular lighting and five meter high waves that pound the soaring timbers and rugged Pacific coastline. Vancouver Island is a paradise for nature lovers. Pacific Rim National Park clings to the western edge of the island. Some of its finest scenery is at Long Beach, tucked between the fishing towns of Euclid and Tofino. Some new trails at Long Beach take you into ancient country on the rainforest and the shore pine bog trails. Here on the shore pine bog trail, we see uh, trees that are mostly shore pine. And because of the 
high water table and extremely acidic conditions, it grows in an unusual form. The trees are dwarfed, and with their rounded clump tops, they look like uh, large cauliflowers. Some of them might be up to 500 years old, and yet they stand only about five to six meters tall. On the uh, ground level, we see a variety of smaller plants, such as the sundew, which is a, an, an insect-eating plant. The giant of the rainforest is the western red cedar. It's a tree that in places is, uh, oh, well, it's over 20 meters around. It uh, makes it one of the giants of the, of the world's uh, forest trees. Pacific Rim National Park is one place where this forest type that we've been talking about will be preserved. That's very important because so much of uh, the coast of British Columbia is, is given over to uh, forest harvesting. This will represent a forest that has been here for several thousand years and will continue to be here for thousands of years more. The Pacific Rim Park also includes the Broken Group, an archipelago of more than a hundred islands. The largest is uh, less than a square mile in area, and the smallest uh, might be just a few, uh, few trees atop a small rocky knoll that protrudes from the water. The Barkley Sound area, of which the Broken Group is part, it has one of the highest bald eagle concentrations in North America. All units of the park have sea lions in it. They're a fascinating animal with uh, fascinating sounds and a, quite a, an interesting smell associated with them. When British Columbia entered Confederation, the Canadian Pacific Railway promised to connect the line by bridge to the mainland. The railway, however, stopped at Vancouver. Victoria threatened to secede and join the United States. To appease the islanders, the Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway was delivered in 1886. 20 years later, CP bought the ENN and built a hotel in its traditional style, the world's famous Empress Hotel, now serving more English afternoon teas than anywhere in England. The Esquimalt and Nanaimo Railway runs up the east coast of Vancouver Island. The Malahat Dayliner, as the train is known, began in 1886, following a route from the provincial capital at Victoria to Courtenay. The four-hour trip begins with a hard 13-kilometer climb toward the summit of the Malahat. The train slowly crosses two bridges that together span more than 300 meters over the Niagara and Arbutus Canyons before passing through the only tunnel on the railway. The journey continues past impressive stands of cedar, hemlock, and Douglas fir. This rail line was vital for copper, coal, and logging companies needing to transport goods from the mines and the forests to the towns, smelters, and pulp mills. Spur lines are everywhere.
Many of the stations along the line are antique and have been restored to showcase railway artifacts. If the train rattles on through Chimenez, try to catch a glimpse of the larger-than-life murals that have been painted on the buildings depicting the town's history. There are tantalizing glimpses of the Coast Range Mountains across the Georgia Strait as the Malahat rumbles into Courtney. Our railway adventures across Canada have carried us from Newfoundland to Nova Scotia, through the Gaspé Peninsula to Quebec City, across Ontario to Toronto and Niagara Falls. We have penetrated vast northern forests and crossed the tundra to Hudson Bay. From the prairies to the Rockies, from the Yukon to Vancouver Island, we have seen this great and varied land called Canada. Railways have come and gone. Some of their routes have been reborn as hiking, cycling, and snowmobile trails. Old steam engines have won a new lease on life in historic folk parks and museums. Some routes will change, and with the Renaissance and train travel, some old lines will be reopened. As someone once said, everything old is new again. The train routes that open Canada will continue to amaze and inform a new generation of travelers. <laughs>